Hi, and welcome back to Leslie's Lab. In the last episode, we took a look at homemade nitrogen lasers that can vastly outperform commercial units. Uh, in this episode, in response to a number of questions that I've received, uh, both in the comments below and off other sites and in my DMs, um, I thought I'd spend a bit of time explaining some of the finer points of nitrogen laser design. So we're gonna put this thing on the bench uh, and strip this thing down and take a look at all the bits and pieces. So we'll get to find out things like, you know, what size of dumper capacitor am I using? Uh, how many picofarads is the pico capacitor? Uh, how's the spark gap made, for example? Uh, another question that I received as well by email was, can we run this thing off just plain ordinary compressed air and expect reasonable performance out of it? Uh, and as we'll see shortly, the answer is, well, yes. Uh, so let's go. So here's the nitrogen laser on the bench. Uh, a couple of you guys had had some uh, good questions, really. You know, what, what's the size of the dumper capacitor? How big do I have to make the foil and so on? You know, what size of capacitor should this be? Um, I've got a small capacitance meter here. Um, we'll just very quickly hook it up to the dumper and you can see what the, the size of the capacitance is. So we should be able to clip over here and clip over there. So we've, we've got somewhere in the region of, uh, I don't know, you know, 2,500 picofarads. Uh, as the dumper. I think these are about 600 picofarads a piece uh, for all four of them. And that's about right. If we, if we come to measure the pico capacitor, uh, the pico capacitor measures 1,350-odd, uh, give or take, uh, picofarads. This actually works out, if you, if you know the length of the laser channel, which is um, uh, 21 centimeters, it actually works out at 60 picofarads for every centimeter of the laser channel. Um, and this is actually um, an ideal situation. If you, if you check up the, uh, the literature uh, for nitrogen lasers, uh, there was some research done on these in the, in the 70s, um, and it was actually found that there was an optimal uh, capacitance uh, for the channel, and it should not be any more than 60 picofarads per centimetre of channel length. Uh, anything more than that is just wasteful. It causes sparks in the channel. It can actually negatively affect laser performance. Um, so, you know, it, quite, quite often you'll see these designs on the internet uh, for nitrogen lasers where you've got these huge uh, sheets of, uh, you know, huge capacitors either side of the laser channel and it's just not necessary to get decent performance. Um, so that's that. Uh, we can disassemble this uh, really quickly. Uh, it doesn't take very long. Um, I'll just disconnect the, the spark gap. And we can see our four uh, doorknob capacitors there at the back. Um, you'll notice there's quite a significant uh, burn mark on the surface of the foil and there's a corresponding mark on the bottom of the, the spike gap. Um, this is because I haven't actually clamped this down yet. Uh, that's the next phase of this design is to actually uh, build a clamping mechanism to um, properly clamp this uh, so that that doesn't happen. Uh, the spike gap itself um, is actually made out of plumbing fittings. I'll show you the originals here. Um, we've got a, a three quarter inch uh, BSP inline coupler that you use for washing machines. Um, this is all that the body of the spark cap is. Um, you, you know, choose the white ones, not the black ones. Black ones are probably full of carbon um, and you don't want um, a particularly conductive spark cap when you're dealing with, you know, tens of thousands of volts. Um, the end caps are uh, three quarter inch uh, BSP blanking caps, uh, just like this one. There's been some modifications. Uh, obviously, uh, we can't have raised lettering on the side, so this needs sanded off. Um, you know, you can just do this on a, on a piece of sandpaper on a, I did it on a sheet of aluminium with some sandpaper on it just to grind that flat. Um, and you'll notice uh, the thickness of the, the original BSP coupling is, is uh, uh, sorry, BSP end cap is somewhat thicker uh, than what's on the spark gap. I, I actually trimmed these down uh, with a hacksaw. So let's pull the spark gap apart and we can see what's in it. Um, all of the fittings, uh, all of the, the metal work in this is all brass and copper. Uh, so, you know, brass bolts, um, copper tubing, and so on. I've got an aluminium uh, connection for my um, dumping capacitors there. All of this just unscrews. Uh, it's very tight, as it should be. So let's just undo these parts. I'll we'll take a look at them. Um, so, yeah, this is the, this is the, the coupling. Um, obviously, this has been trimmed down quite significantly. Um, and I've glued on, uh, or araldited on, uh, two uh, plexiglass discs uh, to prevent flashover over the outside. You know, if, if you can imagine, um, if we didn't have the plexiglass discs there, there would only be five or six millimeters between the high voltage and low voltage side. 
Um, so this is essentially to make the, the body um, withstand high voltage. So that's that. That's, that's all that there is to the body of the gap. Um, for each side of the gap, um, we've got these trimmed down uh, blanking um, ends. Um, we've got an O-ring seal inside. I'll see if I can pick that out. Let me find something to oink that out with. So yeah, we've got a, an O-ring to, uh, to help seal against the body of the gap. Um, internally, it's uh, a brass acorn nut that I've just soldered um, into, the, into the middle of the blanking cap, that's it. Uh, so this forms one electrode. You can see there's a, a burn mark in the middle there where it's been sparking. For the other side of the, the spark gap, we have something slightly different. Uh, this is a brass um, bolt. Uh, we can actually undo this. As with the as with the other side, um, this time we've got a, a, a just a standard brass nut um, soldered into the spark gap. Uh, we've got a hole drilled through the other side, uh, and again an O-ring seal. Um, the actual uh, bolt itself is a standard brass bolt. Um, I've taken the time to round it um, so that we've got no sharp no sharp edges um, on the inside um, of the spark gap. So it's it's just you know it's it's just ground and polished um, until we've got a curved. A curved profile. Um, to pressurize it with gas, drill down the center of the bolt, um, soldered in a piece of copper tubing, and we've also got another hole drilled into the, the, the nut end um, of our bolt at 90 degrees, which meets up with the hole in the middle so that gas can actually pass through the spark cap. Um, that's it, it's very, very easy to disassemble. You know, nothing's all glued together to the point where we can't get it back apart. Um, easy to clean. You know, this, this one's um, actually pretty good. I mean, it's, it's had, you know, it's, it's had several weeks um, of use and I've been using this thing almost every day. I've been messing with dye lasers and tweaking it and getting the best performance out of it possible. Uh, not terribly worn. We don't bother um, flushing the air out with this. I'm j literally just hooking it up to nitrogen and just pressurizing it, that's it. I suppose in an ideal world, um, we ought to be flushing nitrogen through the spark gap, in which case everything would be nice and clean, but it works just fine. So we'll just uh, oh, and again, uh, just before I put it back together, uh, I've got a small uh, O-ring uh, mounted on this, so that when we uh, screw it all back together, we've got a nice gas-tight seal. Well, finger tight should be enough for this. Um, I suppose when the spark gap is is put together, you'll notice that when when we screw this down, uh, the brass face meets meets the uh, meets the plexiglass face just about. Uh, obviously, I don't know. There's maybe a so we quarter millimeter gap in between there because uh, we, we, we won't seal on the O-ring rather than on the plastic. But to give you an idea of the, the width of the gap, if I just hold everything together like this, um, that's about how close um, the, the, the spark gap is internally. So you're looking at a gap there of about one and a half millimeters. Um, and obviously this has got to withstand something in the region of 17 to 20,000 volts, which is why we need to pressurize the gap. That said, the gap is very, very short, um, very, very low inductance, and this is what leads us to you know, such massive, uh, such steep rise times in the gap, so that we can get the gap to fire in the order of nanoseconds, uh, rather than you know, like microseconds or milliseconds or something ridiculous like that. Um, reassembly of the gap is, is just easy. Everything's finger tight, um, although I really do rive at them. Uh, when I tighten them up, better remember to put the O-ring back in. Uh, again, when when uh, when I cut these, um, I've taken the time to round off the edges. Um, you know, I've run them through a, a polishing wheel as well, uh, just to get them nice, nice extra round. Uh, you know, just to avoid the possibility of corona and, of, and to avoid uh, avoid the spark gap breaking down. So that's that's really the secret sauce um, to this laser is to spend the time and build a proper spark gap. You know, not, none of this. You know, a couple of lug nuts. Uh, lying on top of the tin file. Um, we'll just rice that up, good and tight. Um, another part of the secret sauce is to keep things low inductance, so we don't connect things with wires, we connect things with uh, you know flat pieces of aluminium. I suppose ideally um, this aluminium should be much wider uh, and reach uh, each end of the capacitor bank, but honestly the performance has been so great out of this thing, I've not really had to worry uh, too much. Um, I'm going to do something a little bit more permanent as well. This was literally just cut out with a pair of tin snips one afternoon and it, it never changed. You know, obviously it worked, so I never bothered changing the thing. 
there's nothing too special about the capacitors. Um, obviously, they're, they're high voltage types. I'll just come in there and undo the bus bar off the top. So these are TDK um, high voltage capacitors. Uh, they're rated at 30,000 volts each. Um, really, really good capacitors. I've had these for many, many years. These have actually been pressed into service, you know, in other projects like Marx generators and things like that. And they perform really, really well. I've never had one fail on me. Um, they're, they're an excellent buy. As for the rest of it, I already showed you guys in the last uh, episode that this is uh, a needle valve out of an aquarium. Nothing particularly special there. I'm um, just using silicone hose. Um, to connect everything up. I've got a resistor here. Again, nothing special. It's an off-the-shelf part, uh, 5 watt, 120k. The only reason it's 5 watts, um, or the only reason I chose a 5 watt resistor isn't because I'm expecting 5 watts, because it's in a nice big ceramic package. That's it. Um, I'll just remove this. It's just bolted to a post with a, a spring contact um, for the Pika capacitor. And there's probably better ways of mounting this, but again, you know, I mean, it was performing so well. I'm of the attitude is, you know, if, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Um, obviously, you know, I'm going to probably spend some time over the next couple of months and maybe tidy all this up. Um, really, I should probably put the thing uh, in an enclosed aluminium box because it does interfere with other equipment in the room. So as for the laser channel itself, um, I'll just remove this and we'll take a look at it. Um, everything's all uh, bolted down with M3.5 um, screws. Uh, there's only two screws holding the laser channel on. Uh, these are they. Let's get in there. Should just be able to pop that off that's it so what i've actually done here is one half of the laser channel is on the board itself um, and it's actually bolted uh, onto the aluminium plate with again m three and a half uh, machine screws um, again you know you want to you want to minimize the number of poor connections in a system like this so if we make at least one side of the laser channel have an excellent uh, electrical connection then if we've got a slightly poorer connection on the other side of our channel um, you know, we've we've little to worry about. Um, we can see the the hexagonal profile aluminium bar. Um, again, these are cut uh, and the ends rounded uh, and polished so that we don't get high voltage breakdown there. Um, we can see the mechanism uh, that that, uh, that drives this system. We've basically got a spring mounted uh, piece of bar, um, and then we've got two threaded holes inside of the plexiglass so that we can adjust uh, the electrode uh, from each end to line up the laser. And that's it. And the peaking capacitor itself, I'll just remove those. Uh, we should be able to remove this. It's actually stuck down quite fast um, because of electrostatic. I uh, hadn't thought about that when I was pulling this apart. So yeah, when you're actually assembling these things, this is just a tip for, for when you're assembling this capacitor. If you lay down your plastic sheet, lay down your tin foil where approximately you want it to be, and then just very briefly apply high voltage. The tin foil and the plastic will stick to the base metal. Um, I'd forgotten about that. It's evidently still got, although we can't feel a charge, it still has um, electrostatic attraction. So I'll tip this thing up um, so that we can see what's happening in there. Uh, should be able to see that all right on the camera. I'll just give it a wee tweak on the focus. So this is, this is the peak capacitor. Um, it's got a, a, a rather large, um, bubble along the length of it there. I think that was when I just took that apart. I've managed to disturb it. Um, but yeah, it's 190 micron uh, plastic sheet. Um, this was used for uh, making stencils. It's acetate sheet and a piece of tinfoil on top. That's, that's long and short of it. Somebody then inquired about the gap uh, that you should leave between the foil um, and you, you, know, you know how much of the foil should protrude into the channel. And you should be able to see um, on the camera there, the sort of distance we're leaving. It's about two or three millimeters. Let me get there. I'll have to eyeball this uh, from the end. It looks to be, it looks like between the edge of the plastic 
and the edge of the tin file is about four and a half millimeters. Uh, so when the channel's uh, fully assembled, um, if we put it back together, we shouldn't be able to see um, tin foil um, inside of the channel when it's all correctly lined up. So if we can see it, if we can see it at one end just there, when we close up the channel, that should disappear, um, and we shouldn't be able to see it looking vertically down. Obviously, if we if we look in at a steep angle there, we might be able to see the edge of the tin foil peeping through. Um, the reason why it's done this way um, is so that when when the laser fires, if we've got an edge of tin foil uh, that's that's close enough to the other electrode, uh, we end up with a situation where corona is generated across the entire length, and this pre-ionizes the laser channel. And again, this is something that's borne out by literature. Um, it's one of the ways to ensure a nice, good, homogeneous discharge. Again, folks, this is one of these things where you're going to have to play around with it a little bit. Um, you know, you probably assemble this at first and maybe have it too close and you'll get sparks from the, from the edge of the tin file uh, to the other electrode. Um, or perhaps you'll have it too far away and the laser sort of fires erratically um, and so on. Um, but honestly, guys, electrically, that's it. We've got the mirror mount on the end there. Uh, we should be able to see that in the end. It's just a laser there mount, uh, like with the, the smaller version of the laser. Um, we've just replaced, uh, we just basically glued the mirror on the inside, uh, drilled this big mount out, um, replaced the three um, bolts uh, that come with the mount, but then put spring washers between them so that we can adjust um, our high reflector. Um, and that's literally all there is to it. A number of people had asked if it was possible to run the nitrogen laser, all of it, um, including the spark gap, off of plain air. Uh, so I've just set this thing up. I've disconnected the nitrogen feed from the channel. Uh, it's actually all disconnected from the nitrogen bottle. And to pressurize the spark gap, um, I've got a very large syringe. Um, I've also got the dye laser set up in front of the laser. So we'll just power it on. Um, obviously, again, I won't be able to talk much uh, while this is happening. When I first flick the switch on this, we'll hear the spark gap firing very, very rapidly because the gap um, internally is only a couple of millimeters. Uh, once we pressurize the gap, it should start uh, operating normally. So as we can see, the nitrogen laser worked uh, really quite well. Uh, given that the, the lasant itself is, is ordinary air and, and we're pumping ordinary air into the spark gap. Um, the only problem with uh, doing this with plunging air into the spark gap with the syringe is every time we do that, um, we're essentially, you know, we're compressing uh, room air in the spark gap and room air contains an awful lot of water and that will cause it to condense on the internal parts of the spark gap and it can, it can cause a situation where we can have uh, flash over up, up the inside of the walls of the gap. Um, generally, uh, it doesn't cause any sort of serious damage. Uh, it, it, it'll start to bog down the high voltage power supply, uh, and that's the sort of first clue that this is occurring. But it pumped the dye laser really quite well. Uh, we can't pump a curvette to super radiance off just plain air like this, uh, but nonetheless, if you want to get something up and running really quickly and you can't afford or, or can't get hold of nitrogen very, very easily, um, this, is all, you know, this is always an option. Thanks for watching this episode of Les's Lab. If you want to see more content like this, don't forget to hit like and subscribe down below. Uh, I'd like to take this opportunity as well to thank all the new subscribers that I've gained in the last couple of days and all the people that have taken the time to comment. Um, you know, you guys are what makes, uh, what makes good channels like this. So, you know, the more you guys contribute, the more you guys comment, the more you guys ask questions, the more I can show you guys and the better I can make my content. So any feedback that you've got, good or bad, you know, do hit like, do hit subscribe, do comment down below and, and give me plenty of feedback and help me make better videos. Thanks guys.